Good evening and welcome to Q&A live from Lismore, the northern rivers region of New South Wales. I'm Tony Jones. Here to answer your questions, the president of the National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson. The Agriculture Minister, David Littleproud. People's panellist, Matt Sorensen, an engineer who wants to see better planning and development in this region. The former Mayor of Lismore, Jenny Dow, and Shadow Agriculture Minister, Joel Fitzgibbon. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, the drought has been front and centre of the national news agenda this week. Our first question is on that topic, comes from Mia Harris. Hello, good evening. Australian farmers show grit, working long hours and working really hard, while battling conditions both economically and environmentally. With the recent financial aid package announced, some media outlets have reported a farmer saying $12,000 isn't even enough for a load of grain. Why is the Australian government not giving drought-stricken farmers adequate support when they provide fundamental and essential products for the Australian public and its economy? Thank you. Thank you. Fiona Simpson, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And thanks very much, Mia, for the question, which, look, a lot of farmers are, are, are asking and a lot of people are asking out there today. I, I think the thing to remember is that the, 12, the extra $12,000 is, is in addition to the farm household allowance. So the farm household allowance is a safety net that government puts in place really to support uh, human welfare. So in the drought, there's um, a couple of things that particularly we need to look after, and one of them is human welfare and one of them is animal welfare. Traditionally, the states actually have had the role of looking after animal welfare, uh, and the feds have tended to look after human welfare. And so for people who are on the farm household allowance, I think it's about uh, 8,000 farmers at the, at the current level, and then we expect that to go up more with the increased asset limits by the government. Uh, those people, for those people, the $16,000 that they receive every year is a lot of money. And the 12,000 that they'll receive now over the two payments is a lot more. Um, it's really about putting food is on it, the is table. Is it enough? I suppose the question is really asking. Well, it's Fiona. not intended to buy loads. It's not right. actually intended to buy loads of grain. Mm. It's intended to help people put food on the table, put tyres on their car, put fuel in their car, keep some of their family bills ticking along. They're people who probably uh, have very little else in the way of, of spare cash or capital, um, and that's what the intention is for that. So, is it enough? For some people, probably it's never enough, but to be honest, it's a safety net. Uh, and we look to government, both state and federal, for a range of other packages in terms of, of uh, subsidies for freight and grain, uh, for payments for, uh, for other things. There's a lot of bills that are needed to be paid on farms at the moment. Um, and, and drought is a really complicated thing because we have so many different needs across so many different farmers, so many different communities at so many different stages in the drought. Um, but this particular payment is about increasing the farm household allowance, a one-off payment, um, and I think, you know, it is welcomed. Uh, and for those people who don't have very much money at all, and that's uh, people that are on farm household allowance, mm. you know, $12,000 will be a lot more than they've got today. David Littlebrad. Well, look, uh, there's no silver bullet to this apart from rain. That's the reality of it. And we can't make it rain. Uh, and Fiona's right. Uh, the responsibility of the federal government is to look after its people. Uh, the responsibility of the state governments are to look after the animals through freight and fodder. Uh, we've taken that seriously. We've listened to uh, people as we went out and toured Western New South Wales and into my electorate of Queensland, where we've had drought for some seven years, uh, and listened about what we could do living up to our responsibilities. Uh, so currently, a family will get uh, around $25,000 in farm household assistance of 538 dollars a fortnight for each individual uh, parent in that household. Uh, and this is giving an extra lump sum of 12. This is uh, understanding as we went around and we listened. Uh, this was something to provide farmers with dignity. Uh, the reality of it is it's, it's complemented with uh, additional resources into our rural financial counselling service. Now, all of us saw, uh, or many of us would have seen, um, the rural charity worker with the Prime Minister in floods of tears, saying this is a hell of a lot worse than anything you're seeing on the media. How bad is this drought? Well, look, uh, my electorate uh, in, in Queensland, Longreach and Winton and Barcourt, and we've been on this journey for seven years. Uh, let me tell you that um, this, is, this is something that is a cancer that's grown across our country. And we have to realise that this is a fluid situation and, and we need to be agile. 
And that's what we're trying to do as a government, to engage with farmers at a kitchen table. We've sat out at farmers' kitchen tables and listened to them and understood. But it's important that we also have honest conversations. And the Rural Financial Counselling Service are the real angels in this because what they do, they're in these small communities and they go and sit at a farmers' kitchen table and they actually get under the bonnet of these people's business and they try and work through ways of strategically helping the business not only get through the drought but prepare them for the future. And they're there to help uh, go through the application. And we understand the application process has, has been onerous. Make no mistake, and we're trying to work with the Human Services Department to streamline that, but farmers should not self-assess. I cannot stress that enough. In my electorate, more than half that were eligible for the farm household assistance did not apply. Uh, they are missing out on this for the support that we are trying to give them. Uh, so I just urge every farmer to reach out to the Rural Financial Counselling Service. Do not self-assess. Get them to fill out the application process for them and we will help them. It takes about 18 days for the process to be completed uh, and I can tell you we are committed to making sure we put bread and butter on those tables to let farmers have some breathing space to make tough decisions with some dignity and respect. Okay, Joel Fitzgibbon, does the government have, um, in a pure sense, bipartisan support on this? Yes, I think so, Tony. Both David and I represent electorates which are badly affected uh, by drought and we are all in all of the grit, as Mia put it, uh, of the farmers and the farming families facing the worst of drought. We're similarly impressed by the generosity of the Australian people. And I think their reaction to the drought uh, confirms uh, the community's view that government does have a role to play. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but as David said, there's no magic bullet, but there are certainly two basic things government should be doing. Um, the first, of course, is to ensure there is an income support payment when things get so bad and people need support to put food on the table. Uh, the second, which is very important, is to do all that we can to ensure that as best as they can, uh, farmers prepare for drought, but even better than that, can continue to be profitable, if not just at least break even through uh, the worst of the droughts. And, you know, we all already do that in, in, in many ways. Um, we do it through tax incentives, so people invest in irrigation and water storage infrastructure, for example. And I, to be fair, the current government's made some improvements in that area in recent years in, in accelerated depreciation, some fiddling with the farm management deposit uh, funds. And uh, we have similar policies and we support the, what the government ha has done there. But the big missing picture for me, uh, without being partisan about it, and the thing that's causing us to now catch up all the time, is that we're still not accepting drought as what might be described as the new normal, mm -hmm. uh, something that uh, is probably with us on a regular basis. So oh, that, we're going to come back yeah, to so that. I'll get you to hold that point sure. because we will come we back. We need to yep. help farmers on the way to a model which helps them better right, Let's go to another question. Deal with uh, by the way, um, there were volunteers outside uh, this venue collecting money for uh, farmers stressed by the drought uh, this evening. Um, more kind of anger, I guess, from the community. Uh, let's hear it from um, Jason Lawler. All right, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, why is it only now that the government is intervening and assisting farmers when the extent of this drought has been forecast for months? Also, why does the government feel that an assistant, assistance package of less than $200 million nationwide is enough when the forecasted foreign aid budget the last financial year was $4 billion? Why is our own welfare seemingly less important than other countries? Thank you. Yeah, I'll start with the Minister. We yeah. did get a lot of questions um, along that line with the idea that charity begins at home. Yeah, uh, and definitely this, this hasn't just started. We've spent over $1.3 billion on farm assistance and community assistance. Because you understand with the drought, it's not just farmers that hurt, it's also small businesses. I used to own a small business. Uh, and when agriculture wasn't going well, nor was my business. Uh, and so we've got to understand that it's a whole of community that we've got, to, we've got to approach this on. So we've been on this journey. As I said, my electorate's been in it for seven or eight years. Uh, and let me say that we're continuing to ramp that up as we see this cancer spread. Uh, and we will continue to be agile around that. Uh, with respect to foreign aid, I think you've got to put that in perspective. Yes, I think everyone expects us uh, to use uh, what they expect every government, it's common sense. Uh, but you shouldn't uh, cut off foreign aid uh, to cut our nose. Because you look at Indonesia in, in, for a perfect example. Uh, we export agricultural products over $3 billion to Indonesia. And in fact, we invested uh, $950,000 into Vietnam to train up abattoir workers uh, in, in abattoirs over there so that we could send live cattle 
uh, into Vietnam to be slaughtered in the way that we expect them to be slaughtered. So that we have, an, we have a cattle industry in the north. So we've got to make strategic and smart foreign aid uh, that benefits not only us, but also the nation, uh, so that we can have a, a, a fruitful trading relationship. Because uh, if we're a nation of 25 million people, we produce enough food for 75 million people. Let me tell you that if we don't trade with the world, if we don't engage the world, then I don't have communities like mine uh, of Longreach and Dolby and Warwick and Kunnamulla. Uh, we as agricultural need to engage the world because we are finally, for the first time, seeing money put back into cocky pockets because of the commodity prices we get and it's flowing through to those towns. Fiona, you'd be familiar with that sort of anger. And I am. The suggestion that, you know, why are we giving money to foreign countries I, when our own people are struggling. Yeah, and look, and it's a feeling that often comes back to me from the community. But I think the important thing that, and the important point that I wanted to make to, to Jason was that drought is not a point in time. The, the difficult thing about drought is that you don't know really when it starts and you definitely know when it doesn't bloody stop. Hmm. So the difficult thing is how do you actually, you know, do you put all the money out at once? Do you put all the help out at once? It's something that we need to keep reassessing. And we're keeping on going back to government and holding them accountable, whether it's the state government or the federal government, for the, for the circumstances we're seeing out in the, out in the ground. Fiona, uh, Jason had his hand up again. Uh, yeah. Jump to your feet, uh, Jason. What do you want to say? Yeah, look, I completely understand about the foreign aid helping, helping industries in other countries. The aid that, that the farmers are receiving at the moment is for the families. It's doing nothing for the industry. Well, that, so at the moment we know that there's still more people hurting. So in, in regional communities, there's people like contractors, there's small business people, as David was talking about, who if we don't have any harvest in our area, for example, all the contractors in our area won't have any business. So we do need to look and continually look and continually take to government what they're going to do about that and suggestions as to how they should help. And that's what we do uh, on behalf of our industry and on behalf of some of the rural and regional communities. And we continue to do that. But this could be the situation for the next 12 months or 24 months. The forecasts are very dire. So we need to make sure that we can prepare and, and continue to have that conversation so that we can actually, you know, there's no point just putting money somewhere if it's not really the issue. We need to find out actually where the money works best, where the, where the support is needed and what's going to do the best job for the community, whether that's from state or federal. And people need to work together. That's mm. the other thing. Okay, I wanna, you know, uh, we need I'm going to gonna, interrupt because I want to hear from the other panellists. Uh, Jenny Dale. Uh, look, it's a, it's a vexed one. I, I believe that, there's, that one bucket of money should not preclude your investment in other. Foreign aid is really important and Australia has signed up to the development goals. And I think if we can use our foreign aid wisely to reduce poverty and uh, increase education and all the things that foreign aid does, then we live in a better world. We will have then less pressure on developing countries uh, to lift their game and create uh, some kind of equality out there. So uh, it should never be us against them in any situation, particularly not uh, foreign aid. And I'll go to our people's panellists, Matt Sorensen, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mirror Jenny's uh, words in that respect. Um, yeah, I'm not a farmer, I'm not an economist, um, but yeah, just looking at the situation that we've got here, um, it looks like the economics of farming isn't really working at the moment. Um, I heard from a lot of farmers that they can't really compete with the with the imports from other countries. They can't compete you know, in terms of price. Um, I guess that's because there's different standards of wages in different countries and different environmental standards and other pressures. So it's not really a free market at the moment. I think, yeah, there's a few ways to look, of looking at it. You could just go back to putting import tariffs on. Um, but then, yeah, there is that farm deposit scheme which is happening at the moment. And... Um, but my understanding of that scheme is that only the farms that put into it can actually get back from it. It's not actually an insurance type scheme where you're paying a premium and then if you're affected by it in the future, then you actually get to, to you benefit you from that. You want to forecast our next question. <laughs> so I might actually jump to Heather Smith. Heather, thank you. Hi, thanks very much. Um, drought has and always will be a feature of farming life in Australia. So I feel that what we need to discuss is why Australian farm businesses don't have the financial reserves to absorb this inevitable downtime. Um, structural and marketplace conditions in agriculture mean that while an ordinary Australian with a rental investment property, for example, can expect a 5 or a 6% return on investment, our Australian farming community is struggling to achieve a 3% return for their efforts. So I'd like to know what can be done about that. Yeah, David, um, let's focus on the idea that farmers 
should have the reserves or how farmers could have the reserves to actually deal with drought itself. We just heard one suggestion. Yeah. We know uh, about these farm management uh, funds uh, and the bank's involvement. Yeah. What, what should happen? Well, well, look, let me say a government's responsibility is to put the environment and infrastructure around its people and particularly its industry. And, and we're, we've done that, particularly with the trade agreements. And the trade agreements are now getting real returns. There are two or three commodities, I grant you, that are doing it tough. But we're seeing record prices for wool, uh, for lamb. Uh, the reality is red meat hasn't, has probably never been as good as what it was. We just need to add rain. So we've got to be positive about agriculture. The story of agriculture is just to add rain for most industries. Uh, so what we need to do is build that resilience. And we've done that with the farm management deposit scheme. Uh, where we've allowed uh, producers in good years to put up to $800,000 away in a turn deposit and to be able to, to, uh, to be able to use that income and take it away off their tax in the, in the good years so they pay less. And then in the bad years, like this year, where they probably make a loss, they can draw back on that farm management deposit and use it as a resource. So I'm going seen... to interrupt you there because the insiders on the weekend, the editor of the Financial Review, Michael Stutchbury, said there's now billions in these funds. Why isn't that being used uh, to prevent uh, public money being put to farmers who are suffering from drought? Well, it is. There's uh, $6.62 billion that have been put away by our farmers, and so they are using it. And there's 55,000 accounts uh, being used uh, by farmers across, uh, across Australia. Uh, that's actually a, a significant investment, but we are seeing in Queensland, where the drought has been more prolonged, we are seeing a reduction in the farm management deposit uh, amounts. But in other states, it's increasing, as we've seen isolated. It's a big country. You've got to understand that there's parts of this country that, that have had the rain and are making a quid. And so they're, they're so just, just to explain, you're saying that in Queensland, farmers are drawing down on those deposits. They're drawing it back as we speak. Because of the drought. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so uh, the, other, the other piece is that uh, this has been building. As we've had the good years, we've had the good seasons. Not only have they been putting it away in farm management deposits, they've been reducing their debt. Uh, I had uh, all the banks tell me 12, 18 months ago that they've never seen the reduction in, in debt, agricultural debt, the acceleration of that, than what they've seen in the last 18 months. Now, again, we're going in, and that's the nature of agriculture. It's up and down, and now we're going to see it drawn back. But what we've also done and what we've been able to achieve since I was a member, I'd, I'd had a gut for I used to work for a bank. And let me tell you, I've been calling out for farm management deposits to be able to offset against term debt. If you walk into to the local branch down here of any bank and you get a home loan, you can offset your deposit up against that home loan uh, and reduce your interest rate. Well, why couldn't you do that for agriculture? Okay. So I've, we've, we've... I'm just going to pause you for a moment because our question is shaking your head a little bit there. And uh, Heather, I'll get you to stand up again. Uh, you're listening, but you're not accepting what's being said? I'm not, I'm not doubting the accuracy of of what's being said for some people, but I think that the feeling out in the communities and on the ground among the majority of landholders, and, and I speak across industries, whether it's dairy, whether it's pork, and they are all equally affected by drought when we start looking about grain supplies and, and fodder supplies looking out for the next 12 months. Um, there is a great deal of concern out there about their ability to weather these kinds of downturns, which they know are inevitable, simply because there is not the financial return in the business due to the nature of structures in our industries and in our, our agreements and things like that that limit the way that they... The, the profit that they can draw back out of their business. OK, well, I'm going to go uh, to David. That's a slightly more complicated uh, question than the one you were answering, but I appreciate that the farm management well, uh, deposits were a key part of uh, the uh, answer, but what about yeah. the broader question? Well, I think it's important that we finally got some of these banks to sign up. We put a gun to their head and we said, you've got to get on this journey. You've made billions out of agriculture. It's time for you to, to stump up. And gladly, two or three of them have. We've got two Australian Australian banks uh, that haven't done it yet, which is ANZ and Westpac, and they need to pull their finger out and do it pretty quick. Or if you bank with one of them, you should tell them to go and jam it. Go somewhere else. Yeah. But, so uh, but, are you actually saying that the banks held up this process of allowing farmers to get involved? Sure in have. It's been in place since 2016. April 2016, the legislation was put in place, but they were too miserable. They were too miserable to go and do it. Well, the time's up. And, and its reality is if they want to make an investment in Australia and in agriculture, we'll stand up and do it or bugger off. The reality is here's their... Op no, well, they should. They've made billions out of the agriculture sector. I've lived out in regional rural Australia all my life. Uh, and I know those people by name and by face in my electorate. And they do, they've done it tough, but when they do it good, we've got to put the environment around them. And the bank's got a part to play in that. OK, Fiona wants to jump I in. Want to change, I want to change the, the scene a little bit and go back to Heather's question, I yes. think, um, about 
you know, are, we, are farmers doing it tough? Are farmers making profits? What is agriculture in Australia doing? Mm. And I know that individual farmers in some sectors are doing it particularly tough. And, and David talked about dairy, for example. Dairy has had huge problems. But we're looking at, at record farm gate production figures in Australia. Over the last couple of years, we've seen record escalation in profits, farm gate. Uh, and we're looking now at, at, a, at a 60, over 60 billion, and this last 12 months, ABS has forecast that it will again go up. Uh, and we're on this great tra trajectory in the moment about farm gate value. So that's not, you know, profits in rich people's pockets or anything like that. You capture that value at the farm gate. And I know, Heather, you're not seeing it, it's worrying me, but, the, but in actual fact, we know as an industry that we're doing particularly well. And we want to keep talking to government about how we can make that happen. Now, we've had a lot of conversations here today about farm management deposits, which is one tool. But we want to make sure that there's plenty of tools in farmers' tool chests to make sure that, that when they are profitable, that they can actually diversify their businesses, make, you know, make the profits, keep the profits, build the profits. Um, and we're seeing increasingly that farmers are doing that, which is why we're on this great journey. Okay. And we think at NFF, we, we believe we're, we're going to be 100 billion by 2030. Okay. And that's what's we've got a, we're going to. This is an extension, really, of Heather's uh, big question. It comes from Peter Graham. Peter? Evening. Um, panel, I'm a fifth generation dairy farmer. I farm with my wife, my small, my young family. I also run a beef operation where we do some breeding uh, for beef feelers and for stud cattle. I've got friends and family up and down the eastern seaboard that are affected by this drought and it's affecting them dearly. We need to future proof agriculture, Australian agriculture, to reduce the impact of drought, increase productivity and profitability. What is your plan after this drought, and it will end one day, to ensure farmers' livelihoods are secure for the future without, and I'll say again, without the need for handouts? I'm going to start with the, both the politicians and Joel Fitzgibbon, because you didn't get in on the last round. Uh, start with you. Yeah, sure. It's a good question, Tony. And can I just very quickly say on the, on the foreign aid, I think people would be less concerned about what we're doing on the foreign aid front if they thought we were spending drought relief wisely. And it's very clear to me that they don't think we're spending it wisely. And farm household support, for example, has been a disaster. I don't blame David for that. He's relatively new and it's, it takes a whole of government approach and it's been hopelessly uh, handled. But I think one of the mistakes we make in the farm sector is to treat the whole farm, farm sector the same. Uh, and as Fiona indicated, there are some doing very, very well uh, even in, this, in these dry times, and there are obviously uh, some struggling. But we do need a productivity agenda. Uh, we do need an agenda around sustainable profitability. And we do need to assist and provide guidance to farmers uh, so that they can embrace product-enhancing uh, best practice farming methods. I'm not saying farmers aren't able to do that on their own, but I think there is a role for government uh, to play, and we haven't been doing that sufficiently. And until we accept that we're in a new climatic environment, we will never do it well. So that's that's the first step. But you know, a farm is a business, and people make their own decisions about where they invest and what sort of returns they are uh, prepared to accept. Now, farming is a little different; it's more challenging because uh, these are the producers of our food and, and fibre, and we need them on the land. And of course, they face the vagaries uh, of drought. But People have to make their own business decisions. I mean, we have a lot of people moving from the marginal column to potentially the unviable column because of uh, 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 the dry climatic conditions. Uh, but I think there is capacity for governments to provide strategic guidance. We had a, an agricultural white paper uh, a number of years ago now, I think 2014, and everyone had a great hope that it would uh, provide the vision of the government, yeah, uh, the government's belief about where we can drive productivity and take uh, to uh, take agriculture to uh, more sustainable profitability, but unfortunately it didn't do that, and it was a lost opportunity. So governments have a role to play, particularly around infrastructure, the provision of a workforce, which means skills training, all sorts of things, but ultimately it's up for those in the farm enterprise uh, to decide that whether there's sufficient return uh, there for them to continue to make a commitment to that business. Okay, I'll hear from both the politicians. The Minister, um, so... Yeah. 
David, David's basically asking how to future-proof farming. What do you do after the drought? What's the plan for after the drought? Well, we've already started this journey. We put $2.5 billion on the table for water infrastructure. Now, uh, traditionally, well, it is the responsibility of the states to, to build water infrastructure. They hadn't been doing it, and sadly, uh, states of all persuasions have used the federal government as an ATM. We'd had, a, we'd had a gut for, we realised that we needed to put water infrastructure and my, my predecessor, Barnaby Joyce, created a national water in infrastructure fund, two and a half billion dollars to build water uh, resources to be able to irrigate and have reliability of water. Uh, and we can do more. I think that that's a way. But unfortunately, every time we go to build something, uh, the state finds a reason not to. They find some frog that wouldn't like the temperature of the dam or a butterfly that may not like it. The reality is, I'm sorry. You, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision about do you want an agricultural sector or, or do you want to live kumbaya hey, around okay, okay, all right. There's I'm another gonna, piece. There's another piece. <laughs> Fiona wanted to jump in there. And, I'm going uh, to leave that one alive. <laughs> is, is, no, no. Is agriculture um, under threat from what, frogs? What we, <laughs> what we need is a whole of government strategy for agriculture. Mm. So we've heard plenty of times about how government supports it, government thinks it's the pillar, but then when it comes to it, it's all on the ag department to do things for ag. Now, in actual fact... Um, you know, agriculture feeds the world. We do in Australia. We feed, you know, we send our products, 70% of it we export. Um, we have access to many markets and we export a lot of commodities. We have a lot of tools, but we need a whole of government that brings its infrastructure, brings in markets, brings it all together so that we actually have a strategic plan for agriculture. That was the feedback we got when we travelled around Australia, did our roundtable, talked to people all over the place. They said, where is the plan? Where is the government's plan to support our industry. We have a Development Act, we have a Mining Act, we have an a, a, um, Environmental Act that looks after the frogs, but we don't actually have an Agriculture Act. Okay, let, let me, so can that's I, can the I, first Fiona, step. can I just go back to Peter, our questioner? Peter, can you jump up again? What, what is it that you would mm. need from governments um, to help you plan for the future? Tony, so far Fiona's the only one that's got it anywhere near right, um, apart from a few frogs. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're in dire strait in Australia. We have water going out to environmental flows. Yep, great. But we've got farmers starving. We've got cattle dying because they're used to having that water there. We need to... The New South Wales government, sorry, the New South Wales government has given $400 million in the last three months to the Farm Innovation Fund. But who have they got to sell that to the community, to the farming community? Not very many. The farm, uh, rural financial councillors, that's not their role. They don't have anyone to go out and offer people that advice. So we need to really start again. Give the opportunity to give the money. Oh, no, sorry, I won't say give, but we've got to give the opportunity to have lower interest loans, uh, the opportunity to develop your business. If you can keep paying a dollar a litre for milk, that'll do us all in, oh, let me yeah. assure you. All right. You have to plan for agriculture. Joel, Joel want to jump in? Go ahead. Uh, Tony, I have... I have some gratuitous advice for David Littleproud. Probably Do not embrace good. Barnaby Joyce's language. <laughs> uh, it does you no good. Um, obviously, water and water infrastructure projects are important, and the former Labor government invested in plenty of them. But David, like Barnaby Joyce, likes to say we've got $2.5 billion on the table. They always say on the table because it's not being spent, because it's so heavily conditional upon the states matching the funding, and the states don't have the money. Exactly. But more importantly, we have to stop this obsession with water retention. Water retention isn't the answer to everything. It comes at environmental costs, it comes at economic costs. Someone has to pay for the water. The, the reason really no one's built a big catchment dam in recent decades is because the economics don't stack up. They are very expensive and it, ultimately someone has to recoup the return on their investment and that of course is the irrigator. We can improve our soils quickly, more quickly and cheaper than we can build dams. That's the truth of it. Yeah. Matt, I'm, I'm going to bring you in just... Uh, can I just... Uh, 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 just on that okay. point? Yeah. If, we, if we increase the carbon in our soils by 1% on a hectare of land, we, we hold back the equivalent of a tenth or 10% 10 of an Olympic swimming pool. That's a smarter way of doing it. And in doing so, we're having a carbon effect. We're starting to make a contribution towards our carbon... And then we have to measure it and count for it. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I, I, I want to hear how Matt, our account. people's panellists, is, is gauging this discussion. Oh, I, yeah. It quickly gets caught up in... 
<laughs> you tell us anyway. Yeah, no, just uh, mimicking uh, J Joel's uh, uh, words there. Um, I said I'm not a farmer, it's not my area of expertise. Um, but yeah, there are newer ways of doing farming these days. And um, I know what you're saying about environmental flows um, and the balance that needs to be had between you know, people's livelihood, um, ec economics and the environment. The reality is, if we continue to draw down um, catchments like the Murray Darling, then we're going to we're going to have nothing for our future generations to be able to farm from. Um, so I think, yeah, moving towards more more um, sustainable methods of farming is a very important um, uh, part of that puzzle. Um, in our area, we've got um, the luxury of having some really good innovative farms. Slater Farms in our area does some great stuff with um, advanced biodynamic farming. Um, yeah, I think uh, those sort of farming methods are, are the way to go. Jenny. Yeah, look, the Northern Rivers uh, area is really made up of relatively small farms compared to uh, out west. And uh, council, uh, local government, has taken a role in helping farmers in that those who wish to can access some environmental grant funding for either tools or labour to improve the biodiversity on their properties, therefore increasing the, um, the value and the quality of the, the soil and the land that the farmers are using. But also, we brought in, in Lismore's quite a few years ago, the opportunity to farm, for farmers to build a second dwelling on their property at no extra cost to that property. It used to be that that second dwelling was used it had to be used for someone who was employed on the farm. That restriction was taken away, so it could be either a family member or rented to someone who was working off property, just as a way of supplementing that uh, farmer's income without the pressure to subdivide, because one of the greatest pressures on land round here is the loss of good agriculture through subdivision. We have to avoid the urban sprawl. Oh. So sure. that's not something that happens, you know, west of the range, but it is a real pressure on the Northern Rivers uh, farming land. All right, I'm going to go to our next question. It takes us in a slightly different direction, but we've been forecasting a little bit of it. Meg Nielsen. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Um, so I'm a farmer from Bentley, and every day we see the impacts of climate destabilisation. Yes. This, this is the reality. Uh, it's all around us. Uh, our entire ecosystem is affected and unpredictable weather events threaten our ability to grow food for Australia and the rest of the world. So my question is, don't we need to ignore the fossil fuel donors and the lobbyists and have a good bipartisan policy to reduce emissions, encourage the uptake of renewable energies, and protect our ability to grow the nation's food. Fiona, I'll start with you. <laughs> Clearly a popular topic. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure whether to focus. I, I have a feeling you don't want me to focus on the growing our nation's food bit. I want you, you want me to focus on the energy policy, yeah? Yeah? So because I think at the moment that, that what we have and one of the frustrating things with some of these issues, and I'm all for let's, you know, let's get things out of the way and let's grow our nation's food and, and make it sustainable and resilient. And I think if we plan for agriculture, then we don't get some of the issues we've got from urban sprawl and, and bad land use and some of these conflicts that we've seen over, over the last few years. But I think at the moment when we're talking about, um, you know, allowing for emissions and energy and all those things, and Tony, I don't know whether this is the point to start talking about energy, but I find it so frustrating at the moment that we actually have, um, we actually have on the table an energy policy at the moment in relation to the NEG, which is actually, um, it, it, it's, it ticks the box in, for, in terms of affordable, reliable, it acknowledges the Paris agreements, the international obligations we have, it allows future governments to actually tweak those depending on what the community wants in terms of more emissions, all those sorts of things, yet at the moment the politics is blowing that policy apart. Now if we can't even settle on a basic framework like that, 
then how are we actually ever going to move towards what you're talking about, which is actually, you know, more widespread change in those things? So we want certainty to grow our nation's food. We want certainty that we're continuing to improve the environment, to be sustainable, to be resilient. We need to have those conversations in the community, but we also need certainty about investment in some of the energy that we're going to use in the future. And that's why we need a, a, a policy like the NEG. All right, Meg, uh, our question has got a hand up. So jump up, Meg. Yeah. Um, I do agree, but we do need a strong national energy guarantee. Unfortunately, the terms that we've got at the moment just don't do the trick. Unfortunately, they don't, uh, the t emissions targets are too low, and so therefore we're not able to encourage the use of uh, renewables pretty much any further than they are currently uh, this year. And unfortunately, what it does is it encourages the use of coal and gas to continue in business as usual, and uh, it's So, not... Meg, can I just uh, can I interrupt? Uh, from the beginning of your question, your original question, I took it that you're essentially saying this drought um, is related to climate change, man-made climate change. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so. <laughs> I... I think, uh, I, I know that Australia has always had droughts. Um, I know that, you know, the whole world has always had droughts. But we only have to look around the world to see the events that are happening now. The Arctic Circle, um, you know, wildfires. I mean, it's cl very clear that uh, all these effects of our um, weather are, effect okay. are, are being affected by now, climate change. David, thank you very much, Meg. Uh, David, do you accept that, first of all? Uh, uh, that principle? Uh, let me say that uh, farmers have been dealing with the changing climate since we first put a till in the soil. Uh, it's been changing since we first started agriculture and we've been adapting. <clears throat> so, David, the, the fundamental question is uh, whether man-made climate change is causing droughts like the one we're seeing now. That's what Meg is suggesting. Well, look, um, that's a big call. Uh, I don't, I, look, the reality is... The reality is I don't really give a rat's whether it's man-made or not. It's, if we want to go to renewables, if we move to renewables for a healthier environment to breathe better air, well, that's great. Let's do it. But let's do it in a responsible way, a responsible way that we can all afford. Uh, and we can transition that, but we can't do that at the moment. And we've got to be able to turn the lights on, turn the pumps on, and be able to afford. Because you know what the biggest thing is I get out there? And I talk to pensioners in my own electorate in Warwick that's cold at the moment, bloody cold. They can't afford to put the, put the heater on. And you know what? Uh, <laughs> It's got to be, it's got to be reliable. It's got to be reliable. And Hang on, sorry. We're going to, going to have to let uh, the minister speak so you can hear what he's got to say. Look, uh, th that's a great aspiration, but at the moment it's got to be reliable, it's got to be sustainable, and it's got to be affordable. Uh, and we've got a responsibility uh, to make sure that we do that in a responsible way. Uh, now, we're doing that through the NEG and, and working through that to make sure that we do have an energy policy that meets our international commitments, but make sure to each and every one of you, you can afford to turn on the lights, a fundamental right for each and every one of us in a developed country like this, that you shouldn't feel afraid to turn on a heater or a light at night. A uh, quick question, um, so we're talking about the NEG. Uh, so are you happy, personally, uh, to put in place a mechanism that future governments can use to increase the emissions targets? Because that's the core. I think Fiona suggested that's the case. Um, the question is suggested that should happen. Well, well look, the reality with, with energy is the market should decide. We should put in place an environment for the market to decide. That's what we're doing. Uh, and, and that's what we should do. Because if, if yeah. renewables come cheaper, uh, then, they will, then they will overtake. But we've got to be able to provide baseload power as right. well. OK, let's quickly hear from the other panellists. Matt. <clears throat> Yeah, I think this issue, as, as well as a number of other issues which deal with long-term planning, is really a failing of the structure that we've kind of um, made the politicians work within. I think um, if you want governments to, do, to think long-term and plan long-term, they really need to have longer government terms. They really need a chance to actually create policy, implement them, and then see them all the way through. And that way you can really hold them to account. I think another, uh, another great initiative which um, Corey White on uh, the Roadmap to Paradise on the ABC uh, talks about is um, over in Switzerland, they've got a thing which is called the Popular Initiative. So if we don't like the way governments are kind of heading with some of these policies, um, all you have to do is collect 100,000 signatures in Switzerland over here with the population. Um, we've got a much bigger population, it'd be 250,000 signatures. That would instantly take that um, issue to a referendum. So. On these really important issues, you can, you can bypass the government. Um, that, that, 
That's not that's not the point of that's not the point of this sort of initiative. That's not the point of it. It's 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 there as a backup. The main point of it is to have it's to be there as a stick to whack the politicians with if they don't make decisions that are for the people. Right, let's hear what do you think, Jenny, about Look. There seems to be there seems to be a feeling that, that governments are incapable of coming up with long-term <laughs> solutions. It may or may not be true, but there's a feeling out there and it's being reflected in what we're hearing on this panel. Look, I think lots of people have given up on uh, state and federal level of governments and are doing it for themselves. I think in, the, in this area, 2480 has the highest take-up of solar panels anywhere in Australia. Uh, Lismore City Council made the goal in 2013 to become re reliant on 100% uh, on self-generated renewables in 10 years by 2023, and it is heading there with the largest solar floating uh, farm, solar panel uh, farm in the Southern Hemisphere. There are things that people will do. They will not wait for state and federal government to catch up. They will move ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're um, watching a very lively Q&A live from Lismore in northeastern New South Wales. Now, high school students, if you're watching, the third Q&A high school special will go to air on September 10. We're broadcasting live from the Australian National University in Canberra with senior students filling the audience and the panel. If you'd like to join that panel and mix it with the politicians, go to our website, upload your audition video. And if you'd like to join the audience and ask the questions, tell your teachers and uh, get your school to apply as soon as possible. Our next question in tonight's program comes from Jodie Weatherup. Oh. Thanks, Tony. Uh, two years ago, we, me, my family, my son, moved from Sydney to the Northern Rivers as Sydney economic refugees, we like to say. We could at last buy our, our own home by doing that. We love our new community in Lismore and the wider region but in many key aspects, moving to this area was like moving centuries as well. Infrastructure, like roads and transport, but particularly connectivity, you know, the backbone of many businesses, education institutions and health services, is lagging, even with the rollout of the NBN. So, as metropolitan areas strain with population growth, and more people are considering relocating to regional areas, like we did, what is the government doing to apply Malcolm Turnbull's policy mantra of jobs and growth to the regional areas? OK, I'll start with the non-politicians non first. And Matt, I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, um, well, you're a bit of a... You've moved back to uh, this yeah. part of the world. But yeah. um, did you find a disappointment as well as pleasure? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I'm an engineer, so I saw opportunity uh, with the ageing infrastructure. There's obviously a lot of work to be done, especially for engineers. Um, yeah, we've got, a, uh, we've got a bit of a dilemma in Australia. We've got cities that are overpopulated or, you know, heavily congested at least. And then we've got rural areas that are struggling to attract people. Um, one thing I think would go a long way is to, yeah, invest in that infrastructure and bring those towns back up to speed, um, make them more livable, um, increase the, uh, yeah, the level of service of the, of the roads and bridges. In our area, there's a, a small village called Tabulum, which, you know, it's got four or five large businesses around it which generate half a billion dollars um, combined, and uh, we're looking at um, implementing a thing we call the Tabulum Agribusiness Precinct um, as part of the local government um, uh, project. And yeah, things like that are really what we need in this region to try and um, get those roads up to standards, get the villages to be nice and livable, stop them turning into ghost towns, um, and yeah, get people filtering back out into the rural areas. Jenny. Yes, uh, look like you, I came from Melbourne uh, 28 years ago. Um, first of all, my first thing I noticed is no public transport, uh, school buses, and in fact, uh, most people don't know, but the general public can, uh, can catch a school bus at any time. Unfortunately, uh, that's, they don't often run uh, after five o'clock when you're returning from most jobs, and they certainly don't run in school holidays. So that was one of the things I noticed. I noticed that spoke, people spoke differently. I thought I'd come from a different place. I couldn't quite understand people. But I've slowed Could down my speech and <laughs> oh. out. <laughs> and I, I, I got into the vernacular and the slower way of life. But that is a positive. The quality of life in the regions is 
fantastic. And I think anyone who came from someone else, somewhere else will know that. Our statistics show that our population here in this area is high and above the state average till about 25, coincides with you know, ending your trade degree, trade course or your university perhaps, and then it drops and then it comes back up again at 40. I believe it's because people realise that the quality of life when you're at that stage of bringing up children is so much better in a rural area despite the limitations. Uh, one of our challenges is to build that connectivity, particularly with uh, um, even our black spots, mobile phone black spots all over the place, even so close to the CBD of Lismore. We need to invest in that and we need to in build the jobs that will allow people like Matt to come back as he did sooner, not wait till they're 40, and to stay here, knowing that some people need to go and explore the world, but to come back here sooner. We've got a lot to offer here, um, and I think too many people in the capital cities ignore the things that we need. Our also, we also know that it takes usually about five or six years of visiting a region before families can see themselves or individuals can see themselves living there. Matt's a different case because he was born here. But we need to spread the word that this is a fabulous place to live and work and enjoy life and play sport and do all those sorts of things uh, so more people like you uh, come here. Mm, uh, David, I'm, I'm going to bring you in. It seems like, in, in a sense, the, um, the problems we see in the big cities of massive pressure of overpopulation and, you know, infrastructure demands, et cetera, et cetera, could be solved relatively simply uh, by concentrating on building up the regional towns and cities. Mm. Um, why, isn't, why isn't it happening? Well, we're starting that journey. I grew up in a little town called Chinchilla, about 3,000 people. Uh, and let me tell you, connectivity is the biggest issue for us uh, in regional and rural Australia. Uh, not only in a physical sense of the roads and the rail, but also the telecommunications, the tools of the 21st century. We've got all these great uh, trade agreements, but we've got to have the tools to be able to connect with the world. And the mobile phone black spot program is one that we created because as a gnat out in the bush, you know what, we deserve mobility. And, and in fact, we put a tower up in a place called Tabia, about 50 people, but there's a big agricultural sector there. Uh, and I got, a, I got a, a text message from a farmer there, uh, sitting on his GPS guided tractor, uh, trading his, his cotton about to, to sell it uh, while he's sitting on his tractor with, uh, with a mobile phone. That's the sort of connectivity we deserve. We've got to continue to build on that and make that strategic investment because what, what happens is we are now creating new jobs in the agricultural sector in particular. The, the traditional pick and shovel jobs are still there, but the new exciting jobs with technology and science are coming and we can have a career. I'm the product of regional rural Australia. I've never lived outside my electorate and I'm proud to say that I've been able to have a career in my electorate, raise a family, actually own, and own my own business. Uh, but the reality is I need as a legacy to leave that for the next generation and they need the tools of the 21st century. We need to accelerate that. We need to hold a torch also to the telcos because we've come a long way with the mobile phone black spot program but now they're saying, you know what, it's not commercially viable to go any further than that. Well, you know what, they've got to come on that journey or we as a government need to have a serious think about policy settings. So very, very quick one. Um, are you saying therefore that the billions spent on the national infrastructure of the NBN was actually a good investment? Sure. Sure is. In fact, uh, my electorate of Maranoa will have the NBN connected to every household by the end of this year. Okay. Uh, well ahead of metropolitan Australia, and so we should. Okay. Um, Joel Fitzgibbon. And gee, David, there are a few people shaking their heads in the audience when you said that, I can tell you. Uh, At least they'll get it under us. Tony, I, I think, again, we sometimes... I mean, you're going to get unanimity on the, on the panel tonight about the wonders and pleasures of living in rural and regional Australia, but again, we make the mistake sometimes of treating every regional centre or every rural town as the same. Now, there are many regional centres, typically larger, Wagga Wagga, Orange, and the like, Toowoomba, uh, which are doing very, very well and have unemployment rates well below the, the state average. Um, so we've got to work out uh, why some regions or towns are doing well and, and why some are not, because it becomes chicken and the egg. The infrastructure will come from government or indeed the private sector, Tolstra, for example, on mobile towers, if they can get an economic return. In other words, it stacks up economically. So it's chicken and the egg. Uh, we know that many rural populations are in decline, and that is death. So it's population. Now, my experience is, and, and all the literature tells us, that the most successful uh, towns or indeed regions are those who are prepared to be innovative and take on challenges and deal with disruption. 
And again, it happens best when it comes from the bottom up, not from governments down. I met with the local uh, regional uh, councils this morning here who are obviously doing some really good things. But local leadership, both political, um, community, uh, industry, has to drive uh, the ideas, the innovation, has to identify the things that can make the town grow and prosper, and then look to government with a case, uh, something to fund, something they can show there's an economic return for. So we can't, treat, we can't treat every town as the same, but certainly government has a role to play, but the ideas will come from the local community, local leadership. When those ideas come forward and they can be demonstrated as viable, the, the, the money from above, both federal and state government, should flow, all things, other things being equal. OK, remember if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the details. The next question comes from Rakan Golding. Thanks, Tony. Last year, the ABC reported that the average age of a farmer in Australia was 56, 17 years older than the average Australian worker. As a young person in this country, I can have my apprenticeship subsidised, access youth allowance, use hex debt to further my education, and even get a first home buyer's grant to access the housing market. But if you think buying your first home's hard, I'd say try buying your first farm. Without young people in the industry, the security of Australia's food production future is bleak. So what is the Australian government doing to encourage young people into agriculture? Fiona, I'll start with you. Yeah. Look, it, look, it's absolutely critical that we have young people coming into our industry. And the good thing is, is that even though the demographic is still sitting up there at 56, it's been stable for a while. And anecdotally, I can tell you that as I travel around Australia and, and talk to farmers, there, there are a lot of young people who are involved in our in industry, interested in our industry. And there's more and more aspects of our industry that are starting to attract young people, particularly when we talk about technology and innovation and digital connectivity and all, all the different things now that we use on farm. Uh, it's quite a different way of life to what it was 20, 30, 50 years ago. And, and it's exciting to see young people coming back, but I think we have to broaden the horizon. Uh, young people just don't need to own a farm to necessarily be yeah. involved in agriculture. And I think that's one of the exciting things about where we are right now in agriculture in Australia. We see a myriad of careers that you can have from the digital guru text, you know, people right through to advisors, to bankers, to financiers, to, to people who are doing agronomy, to people who specialise in looking at tissue cultures of leaves, uh, people who have the sensors on those leaves that read those things. There's a myriad of careers now that are in our industry, and it's a really exciting time to bring young people in. So how do we do it? We need to concentrate on looking at, at how they can be involved other than just owning farms, and we also have to look at ways that we can do better succession planning. So we were talking earlier about FMDs uh, and what a big load of money there is in there. I mean, why, you know, we're looking uh, actively at whether there's a way of potentially, can we use those in some way as part of succession planning? Can we help the farmers that are there now hand their assets on to the next generation in some way? What are those sorts of things? How can we make them, them, them uh, easier to do uh, to make sure that we can keep bringing young people through? We know succession planning is one of the biggest issues well, in I'm our industry go, uh, today. Fiona, I'm going to interrupt you, just to go back to Rakan. Um, are you in a position where, I mean, do you have parents who are farming or are you actually trying to break in and buy a farm and become a farmer? Oh, look, I have family who owns farms, yes, but you can't expect to be just handed a farm, especially no. when my parents may not retire until 60 or 70. Yeah. Like, it needs to be affordable at some point for young people to be able to get into the farming industry. And I can't speak for every area in Australia, but I know in this area, to be able to afford even a small farm is close to a million dollars, which is just unaffordable for young people. Uh, David, this is a problem, isn't it? I mean, um, OK, there are plenty of other ways you could get into agriculture, as Fiona just said, but the idea of starting and becoming a farmer from scratch is pretty difficult. It is. It's a two-edged sword. I mean, um, the, the high capital costs to get in uh, is actually a superannuation of someone that might have been on the farm for 40, 50 years. And, and, and they should be rewarded for that through the, through the sale of their property. And that, that's, you know, that's part of living in a market economy and we should always respect that. But how do we disrupt the capital markets? How do we, how do we uh, get away from the traditional capital markets we've got or the traditional banks? In, in this country, uh, the, the uh, big four lend nearly more to, on credit cards 
to personal Australians than what they do to the agricultural sector. There's about $52 billion out there on credit cards, and there's $60 billion in ag debt. So uh, are they really serious about financing uh, the agricultural sector? Well, that's, to me, it suggests not. We've got to look at different capital markets and, and matching the, the capital that's there with the human capital, because we want to bring these young people home. And what we've got to do is make sure they can make a quid, because invariably, if they make a quid, they'll come home. And we're seeing that. In fact, I've been out here to a blueberry farm, and, and they were telling me that the decision makers in the blueberry industry around here average around 35 to 38 year old so because they're making a dollar and that's that's about us putting a, a, a environment around them with trade agreements that makes they make sure they make a dollar but how do we disrupt that capital market is the next big challenge for us because also innovation I think about you need to what lift your sky don't just look at what the traditional farm looks like yeah. look at what you know a, a farm of the future might look like and that might be a small intensive horticultural farm um, people are growing you know people can make now a, a really good living and a start on smaller acreages doing some intensive things. Let, let, me, so, let me ask Matt, and I'll come to Jenny in a minute. Let, uh, Matt, I mean, uh, are there opportunities out there for young, smart people like yourself who want to get into um, the agricultural industries, even as an engineer? Yeah, there are. I believe there are. And uh, Rakan's an example of that, people still trying to break into those markets. It's hard breaking into business in general, let alone farming. It's, um, it's, it's quite a challenge, so I commend you on that. Um, yeah, going back to something that I know that I can do, and that's provide infrastructure and, and make these um, towns and villages around the farms a bit more livable for, for communities to want to come back to, to want to move back to the, to the family farm and maybe take on the legacy um, of, their, of their parents and grandparents. Jenny. Yeah, look, I'd just like to bring up something, and uh, I didn't want to get into an uh, agriculture sort of thing uh, uh, with with David, but I would like to raise an issue that's uh, close to Lismore community and that is, and, and broader communities because it's about Southern Cross University. Southern Cross University received $15 million to start the Farming Together program, which is about building cooperatives. This is the region for cooperatives. We've got dairy, beef, fishing, forestry, or sugar, lots of cooperatives, a great success story. So there was $15 million put in. in I think uh, that the aim was to support 100 groups. They actually supported 730 groups in the pilot. The aim was to fund 15 groups. They ended up funding 51. The pilot was cut. And the funding was sought for $5 million more. The expertise was there with two, about 200 consultants who are experts to help all these groups, not all of which were going to be cooperatives, but they were liaisons or, cooper or groups of people working together. And I think working together is also a way of building small um, holdings, working better by coming together. For so their own very briefly, where the funding? Where was the funding coming from that was cut? Uh, federal, I, yeah, federal government, you, federal, federal right, government, okay. and they were seeking five million dollars more. All right, we'll get, and we'll that get, program so is now going overseas. We need to get yeah. David to uh, respond briefly, if you can. Yeah, no, well, uh, and look. Um, the reality is that was a great program, but it was part of the agricultural white paper and it was always slated to finish. There was no, no uh, uh, guarantee ever given. It was going for a set period of time uh, and that was it. Uh, the reality was there's never an expectation that was going past the date in which we funded it. And we congratulate them for the work they've done. But we've got to make tough decisions as a government. We've got to make tough decisions about how we spend money. And, and that's been a great program that was meant to become self-sustaining and self-viable by itself. Uh, and to that extent, I think it's come a long way on that. Uh, but we've been able to move on and invest in other parts, particularly in research and development. Do you want well, to have another? Well, just very quickly, um, <laughs> this program was, a, was one of uh, only a very few in the white paper that was successful. Uh, and they are cutting it. Now, I've, I've just it's met with cut. Lorraine, uh, who runs the program. And the reason it's been successful, actually, is that she's turned it into something more than the government had conceived. The government wanted to focus on cooperatives only, which is a very narrow uh, scope. She's done a much broader approach, taken a much broader approach into uh, broader areas of collaboration and has been very successful, and I congratulate her. So, uh, in, government, in government, would you put the funding back into it? Very well, quickly? you know I'm not going to make our election... Come on, Joel, you, you said it was so Q good. &A, Tony, but the, the point is that they've run all these other programs so unsuccessfully and someone has grabbed hold of this would program. Would you like to refund it if you came to government? I would like to see the program continue. I think it's been very successful. Okay, all right. It's time for... Um, thank you.
We're running out of time, and we have time for one last question. It comes from Keith Graham. Thank you. Donald Trump has promised to make America great again by introducing import tariffs and substantial agricultural subsidies for their farmers. In our country, ever since Whitlam, every successive government, both Labor and Liberal, have slashed trade protection. This has devastated Australian jobs, especially in rural and regional areas, and resulted in a mass exodus of youth to urban areas. As far as I can see, the only beneficiaries of this have been multinational corporations who've paid little or no tax. Are our politicians prepared to make Australia gate again and acknowledge that there's no such thing as a level playing field in trade? Reintroduce tariff protection, protect our industries and provide meaningful financial assistance for our farmers so that they can survive and make Australia self-sufficient. Okay. Uh, so Donald Trump's obviously resonating uh, across the other side of the Pacific and, of course, um, his trade tariffs could generate a trade war. That's another part of the equation. David Littleproud. Yeah, look, Australia is great and we want to make it better. Uh, the reality is, is a trade war will benefit nobody. In fact, we'll be collateral damage to it. Uh, we are a nation of 25 million people. We produce enough food for 75 million. If we want to inwardly look at ourselves and say, you know what, we're going to cut ourselves off from the world, I don't have communities like Longreach or Charleville or even down where I was today in Dirrambandi. They're gone. It's a simple matter of demand and supply. We need to engage the world more than ever. And we are seeing those returns. I'm seeing that in the wool, out in Quilpie. They're getting money in their pockets. For the first time, cockies are getting rewards for the efforts that they've put in. And that's because of the trade agreements. That's because of the fact that we are now opening up options, new markets, and being able to give our producers not only different markets, but opportunities to grow different products to put them into different countries. Uh, this has been a real success story okay. in terms of getting money into farmers' pockets and into communities. I've got to hear from all the panellists. Um, Fiona, briefly. Yeah, briefly. Look, um, the farmers in America have come out quite publicly and said they want trade, not aid. And I think that's what... Uh, we certainly support that. We know that the strength of a, a good industry is in the strength of competitive markets. Here in Australia, we have access to a number of markets built up over many years uh, where we deliver a number of different items of produce. Now, we, we've seen, like... David talked about wool, $200 a kilo at the moment because of the interest in China in our wool. Uh, if we restrict trade, we know we need... It's not a level playing field, no, but we are part of the Cairns group of farm leaders. We continue to push at the WTO. Farm leaders around the world agree that we need to have trade. We want strong level, tr level playing fields and we won't stop till we get them. Um, Matt, uh, populist politicians like uh, Donald Trump can get huge support for these kind of ideas. Um, what do you think about it? Um, yeah, like I mentioned it earlier about, um, you know, the economics of farming, basically. It's a, it's a difficult puzzle and a difficult, difficult one to juggle. Um, yeah, I think it, on the onset, it looks like that import tariffs might be a solution to the problem, but as David mentioned, um, you know, we could be shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, yeah, I think I'm open to other options, but, um, yeah, that's, a, that's an obvious one which jumps out, but it, it needs to be th th thought through. John. Uh, Tony, I don't, think, I don't believe the majority of Australian farmers... Uh, want subsidies or economic assistance. They want a level playing field and equal opportunity, but they want to make, their own, make it on their own. What, in, in what, what about view. the idea that the questioner said there is not a level playing field? Um, Trump, well, has, Trump has proven it and he's trying to level it well, by bringing back tariffs. Well, uh, that, that's for another q and I think, but <laughs> the level playing field. But, uh, uh, I mean, tariffs are a tax on you and me. They're a tax on everything that comes into the country which we buy, cars, sand shoes, you name it. They make our local industries uh, inefficient. But what's happening in, in the United States now is, uh, is companies who manufacture things, who import their inputs to production, which now will have a tariff on them, are lining up at the relevant government department seeking an exemption, and they will continue to line up. Trump's policy won't go the distance. Uh, it can't because it's bad for the US economy it's bad for the rest of the world, and I agree with David, we will be very much a loser in any global trade war. Jenny, I'll give you the final word. Uh, I don't think there is any reason for Australia ever to become a country like Trump's America. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you.
Thank you. I think for the most succinct answer we've had this evening, uh, <laughs> well, I should give you a high five. tonight, please thank our panel. <laughs> Fiona Simpson, David Littleproud, Matt Sorensen, Jenny Dow and Joel Fitzgibbon. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, our extremely lively audience. You can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Scott Wales will be joined by David Davidson of the Royal Agricultural Society. Now, next Monday on Q&A, the radical jazz man in the world of ideas, philosopher Cornel West, Tasmanian Liberal Senator Eric Abetz, South West Australian Labor MP uh, Anne Alley, uh, controversial Canadian free speech warrior Lindsay Shepherd, and as, as our people's panelist, conservative Catholic Jeremy Bell. Until next week, good night.